Welcome to Probabilistic Machine Learning, lecture number 12. Today I'd like to make the connection back to the beginning of the course. We began this course by observing that probabilistic inference generalizes conditional logic to statements that include uncertainty by distributing truth across hypothesis bases. We then encountered already in lecture number two an interesting problem with this framework, which is that it can be computationally very hard, actually exponentially um, expensive, so combinatorially hard, in the number of hypotheses. And we, over the course of all the lectures since then, we have essentially been working on building frameworks that can deal with this potential extreme computational complexity. There was a phase in between where we spoke about sampling methods, which are a generic way to do these, these high dimensional integrals if you have access to random numbers being distributed or being generated from the, question, the, the distributions in question. And then we spend a large part of the lecture until now speaking about one particular alternative approach, which is very important, and that's why we spend so much time on it, which is to consider only random variables which are linearly connected and which are jointly Gaussian distributed. Because in this framework, all the resulting necessary computations are then of the type linear algebra and therefore only polynomially expensive. What I'd like to do today, as we are approaching the end of the, let's call it the Gaussian phase of this lecture course, is to make a connection back before we turn forward to lecture number two, in uh, which we spoke about a very fundamental way of dealing with computational complexity, which is conditional independence. To remind you, back then I introduced the notion of directed graphical models, and um, which are a, a visualization of um, conditional dependence and independence structure in joint probability distributions. And we encountered three different atomic structures in uh, such graphical models. So atomic in the sense that they are the ones that arise in uh, trivariate graphs, um, the, the um, first sort of non-trivial joint distribution. And um, since then, we haven't talked that much about this model anymore, which, or this modeling language, which will become more prominent in the rest of the course. So maybe let's see if we can make a connection to what we've done so far. So in uh, lecture number seven, when we did parametric Gaussian regression, we encountered this kind of model, which back then I didn't write in this graphical form, but we can do so now. Actually, well, I kind of did, but in a less clear kind of fashion. So we spoke about um, function values at various locations from x1 to xn, at which we are collecting data, y, so the data are observed, which is why they are in this um, um, sort of uh, uh, filled in form. And we assume that these function values are generated by some underlying feature functions, which are weighted with a joint set of weights. So these weights are the entire explanation of the data set. And if we are assuming that the likelihood of the individual observations factorize over um, local Gaussian error terms at uh, created at each location by evaluating the function value at that point and then adding some Gaussian noise. And then this corresponds to this graphical model, which is an instance of this fan out structure. So we saw in lecture number two that this kind of structure implies that conditioned on B, A and C are independent. And that's exactly what we see here as well. Conditioned on the weights, so conditioned on the function values, these, well actually conditioned on the weights, the function values are independent of each other and therefore the observations as well. We saw that in the Gaussian framework, the resulting inference cost here reduces, so I mean in, the, in general, inference cost here reduces 
on to uh, the expensive part of computing the posterior over W, which in general can be still be exponentially hard, in, so combinatorially hard, in the size of the hypothesis space over W. In our case, actually, W was a continuous valued variable, so that in general wouldn't really be tractable. But because we make jointly Gaussian assumptions, inference in this model was, was of polynomial time, cubic, because we have to invert the matrix essentially, or solve a linear problem, in the size of um, the number of weights. In lecture number nine, as we expanded towards non-parametric models with infinitely many degrees of freedom, we encountered this new kind of model, the Gaussian process, which at least one way of looking at it is that these models do not keep track of an explicit set of weights anymore. One other way to think about it is that we expand the set of weights towards an infinite set. And in, under both views, it then makes much more sense to only reason about the function values themselves rather than some latent weight space. This then leads to this inference algorithm where the computational complexity is still polynomial, but um, so cubic, but now in the number of observations rather than the number of weights. And in terms of a graph, this corresponds to this kind of essentially fully connected graphical model, where every function value depends on all the other function values. Conditioned on all of these observations, we still have, uh, sorry, conditioned on all of these function values, you will, will still then have independent uh, observations, so the likelihood still remains factorizing in this, in this way, but the prior over the function values cannot be simplified further beyond a joint distribution in which everything depends on everything else. So we actually saw where these numbers explicitly come from. They are in the, co the inverse covariance matrix of our Gaussian process model, because remember from the lecture on basic properties of Gaussian distributions, the entries of the uh, kernel, the inverse kernel gram matrix, so the inverse covariance matrix, the precision matrix, correspond to the, um, well, their sign, their flipped sign, corresponds to um, the sign of covariances of marginal distributions when marginal conditionals, when conditioned on everything else. So this entry, 1, 4, for example, it, uh, the sign of that number is the flipped sign of the covariance between uh, variable 1 and 4 under the conditional for 1 and 4 given everything else. So um, that's one way to create that graph by thinking about how you would generate these four when you're conditioning on everything else. So. The, in these settings, these conditional independence structures didn't really help us that much because, well, I mean, this is in, in some sense the most trivial graph. It's the one where everything's connected. We saw in lecture two that every joint probability distribution can be represented by a fully connected graph, but that's also pretty useless precisely because it doesn't encode any additional information about the joint distribution. So that's maybe why we haven't spoken so much about graphical models lately, except to make the connection to deep neural networks. But there is one more interesting structure, which we have um, seen in lecture two already, which is this one up here. This is called a so-called chain, chain graph, in which, um, well, one way to think about this is in a generative fashion, that we can generate each variable in this chain by conditioning on the previous variable and using that to predict the next variable. So the probability of A, B, and C is given by the probability of A times the probability of B given A times the probability of C given B. And this is the important bit, there is no A in here. Such graphs, as I said, are called chains and their structure is already suggestive of the underlying, of an underlying type of data that creates this kind of situation. These graphs have, um, well, maybe I could say, I could tell you, right? 
there's a kind of a temporal structure to this. If you, if you think of extending this graph in a sort of going forward, then you can think of something that kind of just evolves in one dimension. So that one dimension you might as well call time, um, even though it doesn't have to be identified with physical time, such that at every point in time, the process has essentially a finite memory. At the, what happens at the, at the next time step only depends on what the current situation in the world is. So that the current situation in the world kind of decouples the prediction for future states from the uh, values of past states. Today we're going to try and make this connection more formal. We'll try to think about what exactly this means in terms of computational complexity. And in doing so, we will encounter an entire class of models which have a very high practical importance and are related to or directly connected to a class of algorithms from signal processing and other domains which are so important that I have to bring them up at this point in the lecture. We will only talk about them in this particular lecture and then I will only occasionally mention them at later points because there are so many other interesting models to look at but these models are so important that we have to spend a little bit of time on them and they are connected to the kind of data that you might call a time series. So a time series is a sequence of observations which are indexed by a scalar variable. Let's call it time. It doesn't have to be time in the physical sense, but of course it's often um, that physical time, where um, we, we typically move forward through that sequence. Temporal structure is often also associated with time steps of constant step size, but it doesn't have to be. Um, in principle, time, at least the way we think about it, is of course continuous, but often in practical applications, time is actually discretized into individual time steps, maybe for physical reasons, because the way that sensors are implemented has a certain refresh rate, or for other reasons, these models are called discrete time models. You can imagine that this kind of data set is extremely important. It shows up in everything, well, that changes through time. So climate and weather predictions, sensor readings in um, engineering systems that run through time, medical data that is collected over time from fever cur curves to uh, um, uh, all sorts of readings that you might imagine you might take from a patient all sorts of descriptions of dynamical processes more generally in physics and so on and so on. Economics, stocks, stocks uh, prices, supply and demand data and so on and so on. The previous lecture actually introduced a time series as well, my body weight measurements just to keep the example going. An interesting aspect of these time series is that they, are, um, they often pose particularly interesting computational challenges. One issue is that because it's connected to real physical time, you might want to make predictions in real time. And another one is that the potential size of the data is essentially infinite because time just keeps going and you keep getting more and more data. So the typical setting you're in is that you get a datum, you want to make a prediction and then the next datum comes in and you have to make another prediction and the next datum comes in and you have to make another prediction or associated with the prediction, take a decision. So if you need to decide whether to buy or sell stock, then you wait for a certain amount of time, you see how the market evolves, and then you have to again decide whether you want to buy or sell stock. This kind of structure directly informs the kind of algorithms we want to use in this setting. We need algorithms which are computationally lightweight so that they can deal with a potentially infinite data set. And we need algorithms that are lightweight so that they allow us to make predictions in an iterative fashion at every point in time. What do I mean by, by lightweight complexity? Well, if you think about data coming in at this rate, one datum after the other, then the, you, at every time step, you might have a fixed amount of computational resource available. Right? So let's say you get a datum every second, then you have one second time to take your decision or to reason, to do inference before the next datum arrives. 
So that means the computational cost per additional datum has to be constant. And that means the overall cost complexity of the inference of a data set of size n should be linear in n, should be O of n. Now the algorithms for Gaussian regression we've seen so far are not linear in n unless they have a finite set of features. So we have in these kind of models um, inference that is actually linear in n, but um, it, these models do not allow for the weights to change over time. So in these models you can become more confident over something that doesn't change in time, like these weights. But maybe that's not what you want, right? You have a dynamically changing system and you don't want to become ever more confident. You want to actually track something that changes over time. In these fully connected Gaussian process regression models, you can, in general at least, not do this kind of inference in this kind of data set because the, co the computational complexity of this inference is cubic in the number of data points. So in a time series setting, the computational cost would rise faster than data arrive. And quickly, you'd be overwhelmed with the computational cost of having to keep track of the entire tail of data behind you, and you'd have to give up. So we need a new kind of model to deal with that. And these models correspond, at least in our Gaussian setting, to data in which the, um, the covariance matrix, at least under some transformation, has the structure that, that its inverse is of tridiagonal form. If that's the case, then that means that we can condition on, uh, that we can predict into the future one variable by um, conditioning on everything else before. And that's then convenient because uh, if you have a structure like this, then the, all these zeros in here mean that you don't have to keep into account all the preceding data. Instead, you just have to look at the very uh, most recent observation and you can use that to predict one into the future. If this picture is confusing to you, don't worry. We're going to do the actual derivation in a moment, but I wanted to give this intuition first. Clearly, this corresponds to this kind of graph, which allows us to predict one variable into the future by conditioning on the previous observation and then predicting forward. At this point, um, I should tell you what these models are called. They're called Markov models, Markov chains. So I said that this is a chain graph, but actually this kind of model is called a Markov chain. This is due to a Russian mathematician who was a contemporary of uh, Kolmogorov, actually. He wrote a text in Russian, um, here is the original, in um, 1906 for uh, his local physics society at his university. Um, the title actually suggests exactly what this text is about. It's um, uh, essentially inference in models where the variables depend on each other, but only this particular structure. Kolmogorov actually was the one who popularized this paper because it was in Russia and it wasn't well known in the rest of the world. Um, Kolmogorov actually um, informed the world in some sense about this um, by uh, citing it multiple times. Here is his citation in, the, in his original um, Grundbegriffe der Wahrscheinlichkeitsrechnung, the, the, the foundational text that I've cited several times before. And um, so this is not the right text to talk about what exactly the math is here, but it may be useful for the further thought process to notice that um, Kolmogorov already actually mentions that this kind of independent structure is really at the heart of the, the, the considerations we have to take when we build practical inference models. I've already told you previously that he, uh, that Kolmogorov pointed out that actually the, the, the tricky part about probabilistic inference or about all of probabilistic reasoning is not the notion of Bayesian inference. It's not sum and product rule because these actually follow directly from set theory. The tricky part is this notion of independence, because independence is philosophically so difficult to define. It's easy to define in this formal way that we use here, but actually it poses lots of philosophical problems. Total independence is boring because it just means that everything decouples from each other. And this Markov chain structure is, um, as Komarov writes here, maybe one of 
the most important elementary types of structures one has to understand to build interestingly structured inference settings or inference algorithms. So that's what we're going to do today. To do so, it's a good idea to change our notation a little bit from previous lectures. So, so far, um, we've made a quite generic, we've built very general, generic kind of models, which uh, assume that there is some latent function, which we called f, and it mapped from a very generally structured space, x, which could be more as anything, because that x is going to be masked by the feature functions and by the kernel. So it could be a very generic space, like uh, a real vector space, but also the space of graphs or the space of strings or something else. And we assume that our function maps from that space to the reals. And that all the observations we make are linearly connected to the function values. Now, we're going to use these models that have this notion of local memory that evolves over time. And that sequence, that typical inference setting we're going to be in, is that we are at a current point in time, we get one more datum, and then we want to make one more prediction over the current um, situation that we're in. And that means, first of all, that we will have to consider spaces in which the inputs are ordered, because we need to know what is the past and what is the future. That means that we are essentially restricted to an input domain that is a subset of the real line, and we might as well call that input time, because that's a good word for it. So instead of calling the input x, we're going to call the input t, like time, and we will consider situations in which we have an ordered set of observations, y1 to yn, which are real valued, and they are made at times that are ordered t1 to tn. Now, because we are now not using the variable x anymore, in this community, it's actually typical to call the latent object not a function f, but a state x, which evolves over time. The word state already evokes the idea of a memory that gets updated from one step to the next. So we will call that latent state not f anymore, we'll call it x. That's a little bit confusing maybe to you, because x used to be an input, now it's the function value, but I'm sure you'll get over it and we'll make observations which are typically local observations. So they might be a linear map of, but they are a linear map of the local state, of the local function value, not of all the function values together. Such models have various different names, but one of them is that they are called state space models, because the state is the, the object of interest. From a probabilistic structure perspective, these are called Markov chains, as I've already said before, and actually I've already introduced these Markov chains in lecture number three, when we spoke about sampling algorithms, or lecture number four, when we did, in fact, Markov chain Monte Carlo. So here is just a reminder of the definition that you already saw in that lecture. A joint distribution over such latent states is said to have the Markov property if the ith state given all the other ones, if that conditional distribution can be written as the ith state given only the immediate predecessor. So this should be an i here. I'm sorry, I'll have to fix that. Such uh, the corresponding um, sequences of um, um, objects xi that are distributed according to this, to this kind of factorization structure are called Markov chains. Now, what I'd like to do now is to think about what this kind of structure actually implies for our inference algorithm. And interestingly, for the moment, I'd like to point that out, I'm not going to make any kind of assumptions about Gaussianity or in fact any other assumptions about the shape of the probability density function or whether there even is a density. Uh, well, actually, no, I will assume that there is a density, but I'm not going to make an assumption about what the shape of that density actually is. It doesn't have to be Gaussian. We will just see how the structure of the inference process evolve or how it changes if we impose this kind of conditional independent structure in, that is encoded in this graph. So to be precise, again, we will make two assumptions. The first one is that the joint distribution over the latent axis has the Markov property. And secondly, that the observations are in some sense local. So that means the probability that the, the generative probability for an individual observation at time t depends only on the latent state at time t and not all the other states. 
So let's see what this causes, what kind of structure this causes in our inference procedure. So the typical thing you want to do in these kind of settings, as I said before, is that you're at a particular point in time, you get, you have already collected data all the way to T. So I'm going to use this notation to denote data that um, uh, is a collection from all times from T0 up until T minus one. And now what you typically want to predict is the latent state XT. Then you get one more observation YT and you want to update what you know about XT given that new observation. And then you want to predict the next state um, XT plus one. So that next state, next prediction T XT plus one is again a distribution of this kind of type where we now just got one more entry in here. So at that point our loop uh, closes and we can continue again forward. Then there's another setting in which you already have the entire data set and you just want to sort of know what you actually would know now going back about all the preceding states. We'll talk about that in a moment. So let's first think about this predictive setting where we have data up until this time. So I'm going to do the detailed derivation. Actually, you know what? I'm going to show you what the result of this derivation is going to be and then we'll do the detailed derivation um, so that you don't get confused. So it turns out that this kind of uh, predictive distribution actually can be simplified quite a lot into this kind of expression. So what this means is, what, what, what you can read off here is to compute the prediction for the state T given all the preceding data, take your posterior that you've computed in a previous step so that's a posterior over the state at time t minus one, given all the data up until and including time t minus one. Then multiply it with this um, sort of predictive distribution, this conditional that we have from our assumptions and marginalize over t minus one. This structure is actually called the, this, this particular equation is called the chapman kolmogorov equation. So here's the full derivation for it. I know that this derivation often confuses people. So here's a simplified derivation, which is suspending your disbelief a little bit. So one simple way to explain where this, where this equation comes from is to say, well, um, let's just consider the joint distribution over xt and xt minus one, given all the preceding data. Um, now use this uh, conditional independent structure implied by the graph which is, sorry, no, so first use just the just, just a product rule, right? So, so just write, rewrite this in the generic form that you can do for any joint distribution. So it's just xt given xt minus one and whatever else was on the right-hand side times p of xt minus one given whatever was on the right-hand side. And now use the uh, structure of this chain graph. So that means xt is independent of all the previous data because they're all on the left-hand side and they're shielded away by this graph. And that means we can drop this y from here and now just marginalize out over um, xt minus one. And this process of doing that already gives us exactly this equation that we had on the previous slide, which is called the chapman kolmogorov equation. Now, annoyingly, what I've just done here is I've waved my hand around a little bit and just said, ah, you know, now you just use the structure of the graph. But notice that this expression here isn't explicitly an expression that you have up here. So if you want to be formally precise, I have to reduce, like I actually have to show that this is true, that I can just drop this y from this expression. So if you think you'll just believe me, then you can stop listening for two or three minutes now. And if you don't believe me and you want to see how that actually works, I can show you the full derivation again. So let's do proper inference. So what is this conditional distribution? Well, it's given by um, Bayes theorem, right? So the probability for xt given all the data can be written as the prior for xt given the likelihood for all the observations given xt divided by a normalization constant. Now, annoyingly, we don't really have a prior for xt, so we have to construct it by expanding onto an, uh, an, an object that we actually can talk about. So we write the probability for xt actually as a joint distribution over all of the latent states x, and then we just marginalize all, out all the latent states that aren't the one we care about, xt. Normalization constant for that is the same thing, but now we also marginalize over xt itself. So it's just a, an integral over everything. Now in that expression, we'll do um, two things. So first of all, let's move um, these likelihood terms sort of to the left, 
And then let's expand the, the joint P of X using exactly the Markov chain structure. So now we're introducing the, the assumption that we've made. So we can write this joint distribution over um, all the latent state X as the probability for X zero times a long sequence of individual terms where uh, we always just get a conditional for X, uh, for one particular X given its immediate predecessor. And those, are, those can be structured into three different parts. There is starting from X zero, we move forward through time all the way up until um, the, and right before the time T that we care about. Then there is the individual term for the prediction of XT. And then there's all the stuff that follows afterwards. We can do the same in the denominator. So here I've actually just done the exact same thing in the top and the bottom and the numerator and the denominator of this fraction. And now we look at these expressions and first of all you'll notice that for all the quantities that come after xt there is an integral here over the corresponding individual elements so xj where j is larger than t and there is no y associated with them because we assume that we only have data up until t minus 1 so far. So that means this integral up here actually can be moved all the way over here and the same goes in the denominator. So that means we have the same terms in the numerator and denominator and they just cancel out. So we can get rid of all of these green terms here at the back. So now we can go to and have a look at these blue terms that are a little bit more interesting. So here again we notice that and here at this point you might want to stop the video and stare at this for a bit otherwise it goes too fast. We'll notice that um, for all the terms that involve an x that um, is at a time j that is less than t, explicitly less than t, there's a corresponding situation here that you have a likelihood term and a prior term that show up individually factorizing at the, in, in the numerator and the denominator. So they cancel out. And the only thing that's left is explicitly this final term, which is the bit where we compute an xt given xt minus 1 times this entire interesting blue thing. And what that is, is explicitly just a posterior over xt minus 1 given um, all the data so far. So notice that there is no corresponding term with a yt yet. So this, um, the fact that here is uh, that, that, that um, well, and, and this integral is not over xt, right? So um, up here, there uh, is no integral over dt minus 1. There's only a term over an uh, individual remaining integral over um, dxt minus 1. OK, so this gives us this chaplain kolmogorov equation. And now we sort of might believe this statement a little bit more. This is what allows us to take all of the data up until and not including the current point t and predict xt. This is called the prediction step. Now we make an observation at time t, so we get our yt. So what, how, what do we have to do to include this yt in our posterior over xt? Well, we just have to use Bayes' theorem. So that's easy. This part is actually trivial. The, this is called the update step, and the update just consists of multiplying the term we computed in the previous step, the um, from the chapman kolmogorov equation with the local likelihood, and this is just a local object that completely only is available at time t, and normalize. Fine. Okay, so now if our only task is to predict into the future, and we don't care about previous predictions we've made, then we're actually done. This is an interesting observation because this is often the setting that we're in. You don't really care anymore about what you predicted in the past. You only want to make sure that your current prediction is the correct posterior. Now, nevertheless, sometimes there are situations in which you want to look back through time and decide what you would now actually predict or what you now actually know about older previous states. To do that, it actually turns out that you still don't have to pay a, comp a, a cubically high price. Instead, if, you, if the only thing you care about are the marginal distributions, so the predictions you really should have made at preceding times about the state at time t, then there is another sequential kind of algorithmic step which moves back through this time series 
and fixes mistakes basically that or fixes uh, reduces uncertainty by introducing all the information of later subsequent observations and this step is called the smoothing step and here is how it is computed so we now care about this expression which is our posterior distribution at a particular point in time t given all the data not just the preceding data anymore so to do that we can do a similar step to uh, what we did in the chapman kolmogorov equation we just introduce the subsequent state rather than the preceding state and write this as a marginal over this bivariate distribution and now to use the product rule to expand so we write xt given xt and t plus 1 given y as xt given xt plus 1 and y times xt given y. Now we um, expand these individual terms in there so um, this is the bit that we will need to care about next. So this is something you might already have in the preceding iteration so as we go back through the, um, the chain in time you, let's assume that we have this distribution already Notice that you actually have this distribution at the end of the chain. So once you've moved all the way from the start to the end, you've seen all the data and at time, at time capital T, you have exactly this kind of object you care about. So that's a start of an induction. And now let's see what happens if you go backward. So we need to think about what this term actually is here in this integral. So to do that, um, let's expand it. This is essentially a posterior, right? So we can write it in terms of a prior, times the likelihood divided by a normalization constant. That's really just the standard thing. And now we use the Markov chain structure again. So this term here will not uh, change. The, the part of the denominator we'll think about in a moment. And here we notice that the conditional for all future data from t plus one until n, given all the past data and these two states is actually given by the corresponding distribution where we drop the current state xt because of the Markov chain structure. The same goes down here in the denominator. So we can basically do the same change and then notice that the integral here doesn't matter anymore because the integral is over xt. So um, xt is not a part of this expression anymore so we can move the integral to the right hand side. And now we're just um, we have the same terms here on the left and the right and we're left with an expression which is I mean this here is just this integral is just one because it's an integral over probability distribution so we're just left with this expression and this expression is something that well we can talk we can think about more but you can already imagine what's going to happen here so let's see what happens actually <laughs> So, so here we do a similar kind of expansion. We can um, think of this conditional distribution as, again, sort of speaking intuitively as a posterior, essentially. So we write it as a joint divided by a normalization constant. You could also say we use the product rule. And then um, up here, again, you sort of turn the crank the handle again, use the, the, um, the product rule to expand this bivariate distribution into two conditionals. And here, this is the interesting part now that we have to look at, we now notice that um, this is a prediction for xt plus one, given xt and all the previous data, so here our Markov chain structure helps us again. We can drop this y and you are just left with um, this expression. And now we can take this expression as it is from here. Let me notice that this expression is equal to this expression. That's the expression we needed in the integral up here. So let's take that and plug it into the thing up here. And now we notice that um, there is an expression here over xt given all of the previous y's. This doesn't depend on xt plus one. So we can take it outside of the integral and we're left on the inside of the integral with this kind of object. So notice that this is something that we already have. We have that from the prediction step in the first phase of the algorithm where we move forward through time. And 
these expressions are things that we have as well. So here is the term that we actually have from our um, Markov assumption. Here is a term that we have by induction. So we have it at the beginning or sort of at the intermediate point where we've reached the end of the chain and then we can move backward and close it by induction. And here is an expression that um, we have that is actually of the same kind of, the kind of structure as uh, this one, which we have constructed in a previous uh, time step. And by the way, I'm sorry, this should be a zero here, not a one. Okay, so now we're left with only expressions that are available at this point in time. And of course, this might still be a complicated integral, but at least it only involves quantities that we now know. These three steps, each of which are of complexity at most, linear in a number of time steps, have names in the signal processing community. This is called the prediction step, the first one moving forward. This is called the update step. It's basically just Bayes' theorem. The prediction step in this particular ab abstract form is also called the chapman kolmogorov equation. And this sort of moving back step where you go back through time to correct your predictions is called the smoothing step. And if you've heard any kind of signal processing before, you might have heard these terms prediction, filtering, and smoothing before. So before we move on to actually build algorithms, let's summarize the abstract observations we've just made. If we assume that the stochastic process we're trying to do inference on involves a Markov chain, so if it involves a latent state which evolves in such a manner that the next state in the chain is conditionally independent of all the previous states given the previous state, then inference in this chain separates into algorithmic steps that ensure that the overall cost of inference on all the marginal distributions of the states is linear in time. And this happens more precisely in terms of these three steps. So moving forward through time and making predictions at every point t involves predicting given all of the past data points and then updating using the most recent datum. This is called the filtering process if you keep doing that forward through time. And if at some point the time series ends and you now would like to make a correction for how you would now believe the states at time t actually, what they actually were, what their values were, given everything you've seen now, then you can fix these, the, or sort of update this uh, marginal posterior distributions also in a process that is linear in time. And this process is called smoothing, and it involves solving this equation. In both the chapman kolmogorov equation and the smoothing equation, there is an integral over a general probability density function. So I haven't told you how to actually do this in practice yet, but we already know that no matter how, what exactly the structure of these probability density functions are, assuming that they all exist and that the corresponding fractions exist, the inference in this model is going to be linear cost in time rather than cubic cost as we had in general Gaussian process regression so far. So we're going to move on now to think about how to uh, do this in practice with concrete distributions. But here is a good point for you to take a quick break. Okay, so that's all nice and dandy, but we haven't actually built something yet that we can really work with on a computer. It's just a bunch of abstract symbolic uh, derivations, which have shown that complexity in this, uh, these kind of models is reduced by this conditional independence structure, but it hasn't given rise yet to a concrete algorithm. So maybe to rewrite or to, to, to convey to you a little bit better what we're trying to do now is we want to construct an algorithm like this that you could call inference, which is a for loop. So that means it has O of n cost structure that moves, um, that performs inference in this time series of, uh, with n individual entries, which, has, which is defined by um, these uh, uh, sort of three types of, of objects and an instantiation, an initialization of the induction, 
then a prediction distribution and an observation distribution and does that by moving through the time series first from the front to the back and then from the back to the front doing filtering and updating into the, in, in the forward pass and then smoothing in the backward pass. And what these words mean, filtering, updating and smoothing, we encountered on the previous slides, at least in these abstract expressions that encode what we need to do now. So to do this in practice, of course, on a computer, we have to choose specific values of these distributions. Once we have them, we can then hope to think about how to do these two integrals, which are going to be the tricky parts here. And well, there's an integral here, hidden in here as well, which is the normalization constant of Bayes' theorem. So they are going to be tricky integrals. So what are we going to do? Well, let's make our lives easy and assume for now, and actually for the rest of this lecture, that all the distributions in this process are Gaussian and that all the relationships between variables in them are linear. Because we know from previous lectures that if, if that's the case, then everything becomes tractable and linear algebra again. So let's assume for the moment that we have this kind of relationship. This is a relatively generic way of writing down uh, this set of assumptions. So we'll assume that the prediction distribution is a Gaussian distribution, which uh, maps, provides a linear relationship between the previous state and the next state with some Gaussian covariance, let's call it Q, and the linear map is called A. We need to initialize, um, let's say at time zero, we have an initial belief over X zero, which is Gaussian, it has a mean and a covariance called M zero and P zero. And the observation likelihood is again factorizing, so as in previous like assumptions on previous slides, and the relationship between the latent state and the observed thing is also linear with a matrix called H, and Gaussian with a covariance called R. Actually, the names of these variables are standard in the literature. They are not just, it's not just something I came up with right now. They are actually uh, used throughout this kind of filtering and smoothing literature. This isn't maybe the most generic way to write that down. You could come up with a few more. For example, there could be a shift in here and in there as well, but that would, wouldn't really change things all that much. So it could be an affine map rather than a linear map. And these variables A and Q and R and H could all depend on time. They could be different in time. That doesn't really change the following derivations at all. You can just add indices I to all of these quantities and then everything like follows through. Um, I will not do that to simplify the notation a bit. And such models are then called linear time invariant Gaussian systems or LTI for linear time invariant Gaussian systems. Let's see what these prediction, update and smoothing steps correspond to if we make these Gaussian assumptions. So we need to implement the chapman komogorov equation which is this expression. So here we just plug in the quantities we have from above now. So the prediction distribution comes from here. We just plug in A and Q and we assume by induction that we have the posterior distribution over the preceding state given all the, uh, all the preceding observations. I'm now actually assuming we make observations from time one onwards. That simplifies a little bit uh, what we're going to write down. And let's assume we have this distribution and it has a mean and a covariance which has, uh, we, we call m and p at time t minus one. Clearly, we have such a quantity at time zero by assumption, so this is going to work if we get the, everything stays Gaussian, which it will. So here we have a Gaussian times a Gaussian, and then oh, there's a d, dx t minus one missing, I'm sorry, and that gives a product of two Gaussians, which is another Gaussian times a normalization constant, so that other Gaussian integrates to one. So what's the normalization constant? It's this quantity. So the, it's a Gaussian distribution over xt with a mean that is given by applying the a map A to the previous mean and um, the applying um, A from the left and right to the previous covariance and adding Q. This resulting distribution is often called the prediction distribution and it has means and variances which are usually written as mt minus and pt minus because we are not yet at the posterior sort of that closes this induction here because for that we first need to introduce the next observation. 
And to that, for that, we just do Bayesian inference. So that's actually really straightforward. We um, just compute a posterior distribution over xt given all the data. For that, we incorporate the next observation, which comes from this observation model. And we just use Bayesian inference. So we just write down the standard form for Gaussian posteriors. It actually, in this literature, this, um, there is a, a notational sort of uh, convenience that is often used, which is to introduce two quantities, z and k. z is the residual, so this is a quantity you've seen on previous slides in the Gaussian process lecture. z is the distance between what we observe and what we would have predicted to observe. Notice that there's this h in here because we're assuming that the observations are linearly related through h. And then there is this expression, which you know from the Gaussian process lecture, which is the matrix to invert times the covariance between the observation and the thing we're trying to predict. And this whole object together is often called the gain. And in this notation, or in this community, just to confuse us even further, this matrix is often called k. This isn't a kernel, it's a gain. And this k comes from the name of the person who introduced, well, at least popularized the theory for these kind of algorithms. It was Rudolf Kalman, and this is called Kalman filtering, and therefore this capital K remind, reminds us of him. No, notice that there is a matrix in here, so you might now be thinking, oh, but I thought I could get away without inverting matrices. This is a matrix that is totally local. So this object is of size of Y. If Y is a scalar, then this is a scalar. And if Y is a vector, then this is a vector or a matrix quadratic in the size of this particular vector Yt. Not of the size all of the previous observations. Um, using these quantities, we can, we can write the posterior update and the posterior covariance actually like this. You can convince yourself that these are the same expressions you've seen on previous slides if you want to uh, by going back to previous lectures. It's just a different way of, the, of introducing new notation that is historically um, like due to history. Doing that gives, closes our induction. So now we have our posterior over xt given all of the data up until and including t. It has it's a Gaussian with a mean and a covariance, which we now call, are allowed to call, mt and pt. And with that, we could now move on to the next time step and basically repeat this process again. So now we are able to do that where um, t is replaced by t plus 1. This process prediction and update, iterating between the two, moving forward through time, is called Kalman filtering. There's also, um, uh, actually, the, the, the process also works the other way around. So if we now arrive at the very end of this time series, at capital T, and now want to correct all of our marginal beliefs over previous states, then we have to implement the smoother step. That smoother step is a little bit more elaborate, but it's also possible within, Gaussian, in the, within the Gaussian framework we, uh, to compute the posterior over xt, the marginal posterior if you like, because it's only over xt, given all the data. We look up on previous slides what we need to compute, and then notice that these are all quantities that we have. So here is our Kalman estimation distribution, that's what this thing is called. So it's a Gaussian over xt with mean mt and covariance pt. This thing here is our predictive distribution, which we have above, so we can just plug it in. This thing here is something that, uh, that's actually the, actually the only really interesting object. So this is a quantity that we assume to have by induction. Notice that we have it by induction if we've previously done Kalman filtering, then at the very end of the, of the sequence of the chain, we have exactly this object. We make our final observation y, and then our Kalman est estimate at time t, capital T, is this distribution. And now let's assume by induction that we have it for all the steps going backward as well. So at then at time t, we have this for time t plus 1. And oh, there's a bug here. The, this is a Gaussian distribution, let's assume, which, because it is by induction, which has a mean and a covariance. And this mean is usually written as the smoother mean, so m index t plus 1 subscript s and a smoother covariance. And here I've, I've exchanged a super and superscript, so it should be p t plus 1 superscript s. And we need this normalization constant here, which actually is a Kalman prediction, um, a Kalman estimation distribution as well. So it's of the same type as this thing here, and we just uh, need it for uh, t plus 1. So that's also a Gaussian. 
So all of these can be moved together. I, don't, I won't actually go through this in detail. You can do this for yourself. It's like a little um, hand exercise, if you like, a back of the envelope calculation using Gaussian identities. But it's clear that it's going to work, right? There's lots of Gaussians here. Everything is Gaussian linearly related and there is an integral at the end. And that will give us a new Gaussian distribution. It turns out that that distribution is given by a Gaussian over xt with a smoothed mean, a so-called smooth mean, which is given by the estimation mean from the filtering part plus an object g, which I'll define here below, which is called the smoother gain, times the residual, not between observations, but between the smoother mean at the next location and the predictive mean at the next location. So what, what we have here is basically the difference between what we thought xt plus 1 was before we got to see later data and what we thought afterwards. That's kind of a correction. And this gets multiplied by this object, which is the um, sort of, um, the, well, it's called the smoother gain. So what this is, is the covariance between the current location and the next location um, times the inverse of the predictive covariance at, the next at uh, this location. And actually, at this end, the covariance between this and the preceding location. Let's go like this. Uh, all right, and there's a corresponding um, expression for the, for the smoothed covariance. This is also a Gaussian, and these quantities in here, this and this, as the smoothed means and smoothed covariances, are, as I said before, denoted mt smoothed and pt smoothed. So to summarize, if you make the linear Gaussian assumption, so if you assume that all the quantities in your model are linearly related and jointly Gaussian distributed. And start the induction by assuming that you have a Gaussian distribution on the original very first state. Then in these time series Markov chain state space models, inference on the marginal distribution, the kind of thing you want in a time series setting for um, all states at arbitrary time t separates into two algorithmic steps, filtering and smoothing. And all of the computations you need to do in this process are simple linear algebra operations that are local and therefore can be done in time linear in the number of observations. And they consist of these, the Kalman prediction step, which is a simple computation to compute the predictive distribution. The Kalman update step, which consists of this uh, computing these quantities to compute a so-called estimation distribution for xt. And then the smoothing step, which isn't named for Kalman because I understand it wasn't actually derived by him, but instead by three guys called Rauch, Tung and Striebel. And um, it amounts to this relatively simple update that looks like this. Actually, there are variants of this smoothing, um, of how to write the smoothing update. These are the ones that are connected with these three names. With that, we're at another gray slide. To remind you, um, we've already spoken in the first part of this lecture about the notion of Gaussian, of, of, uh, sorry, of Markov chains and Markov structured models. I'm not going to uh, just leave this up here, but I won't talk about it again. But we saw that in such models, inference is of computational complexity linear in time. That itself doesn't really mean, tell us yet what exactly the inference actually is. It's just an abstract statement. But if we make jointly Gaussian assumptions and linear relationships between the variables, then we have a linear Gaussian system. And in such systems, inference on all the marginal distributions separates into Kalman filtering and RTS smoothing. Okay, so this is the practical content that I wanted to cover in today's lecture. I didn't show you a code, ex a code example, but actually I would hope that some of you might be interested in just trying this out yourself. Just take a time series and uh, construct or define these uh, quantities that we have here and try out for yourself whether you can do this kind of inference. Now, for the rest of this lecture, I want to address a theoretical question that some of you might already have having followed along today's lecture, which is that here we're talking still essentially about a regression problem. So there is 
a, um, a, the data set consists of pairs of x and y's, of inputs and outputs, and everything is jointly Gaussian related. And in the end, we're learning predictions for the latent function, which we now call the latent state, at all the times t. But the way we've defined this model, even though it's a Gaussian regression model, if you like, is quite different from the way we've defined Gaussian regression models in previous lectures. There is no kernel here in this presentation. And everything is instead phrased in terms of this Markov prediction distribution and the observation likelihood. So this likelihood is quite similar to what we've seen in previous, in previous lectures, but this thing here is a, a sort of a new way of representing, if you like, our machine learning algorithm. So the natural question you might have is, how is this family of models related to the Gaussian process regression models that we've discussed in the previous lectures? To answer this question, we have to think about what happens in between the observations. So up until now, I've only spoken about the predictions for function values or latent states at particular points in time that are discreetly spaced away from each other. And this is fundamental to the way I've, I've done this presentation because this discrete relationship allows me to define these quantities A and Q which are these linear maps. With this particular form, I can't yet make predictions at time points that lie between the discrete points in time we make predictions. But of course, time being a physical sort of dimension of space-time is a continuous object, at least for our purposes. So how can we take this model and make it into a, turn it into a continuous time model? That continuous time model would then allow us to draw function values at any point in time. And that's clearly something we need to be able to relate this to Gaussian process models. The way I would like to do this, because I only have half an hour and because I don't want to give an entire lecture course just on this particular relationship, is going to be a little bit pedestrian. So I ask for your understanding, for your suspension of disbelief, when I'm drastically simplifying some relationships here. And those of you who know, who might have heard, taken the lecture in stochastic processes or uh, just um, stochastics might uh, be a little bit disappointed by the way I do this. But um, this is a computer science lecture in machine learning and not a stochastic processes lecture. So I hope it's okay. So what we're trying to do is that we currently have these um, Gaussian distributions, and actually there is essentially a joint Gaussian distribution here over these discrete time points, which you can get by starting at some point and then drawing forward individual states using the conditional distribution to actually draw states. If you don't understand how that works, you might want to stop the video here for a second and think about how I created this image. So I actually made this image with a very specific choice of jointly Gaussian related distributions with a time step delta t, which I, um, like, without loss of generality, have just decided to be one. So I can, I can just index time by uh, natural numbers. And then I've started this process with a q, so with a predictive variance that is just one. And actually I've set a to one. So we're just predicting a new state by taking the previous state and just adding Gauss, standard Gaussian random noise. Standard Gaussian, with, by that I mean zero mean variance one. Now, one way one could think about making this into a continuous process is by interpolating between these values in distribution. And what I mean by that is that we could make twice as many of these uh, function values of these states, state values, by taking time steps of size one half and halving the variance. So that means after I've taken two steps, I've added variance one because I've drawn two independent Gaussian random variables 
And the variance of a sum of Gaussian random variables is the sum of their variances, as you can easily convince yourself of using standard properties of Gaussian distributions. And then I can keep doing that and half the, um, the time step again to one quarter. And by now you might have noticed that this means that the variance of the individual update step is just given by the time step, right? So from one to one half to one quarter. Now the question you could ask is, and you're not alone in asking that, what the resulting object is if we take the infinite limits towards delta t uh, at like the infinite limit of delta t towards zero. It turns out that there is actually such a limiting object and it is a stochastic process that we've seen before. You might have seen this plot, so just seeing this plot might convince you that we've seen this process before. Now it turns out that doing this precisely is actually shockingly hard mathematically and it opens up a super complicated can of worms which I cannot talk about in this lecture because it goes way beyond the scope of this lecture. So let me just say that there is a probability measure that corresponds to the, um, in some sense, infinite limit or infinitesimal limit of the Q that you get when you take the time steps towards zero. And this probability measure is called the Wiener measure. And it gives rise to these kind of sample paths, which are Brownian motion, because intuitively speaking, at every infinitesimally small time step, the process gets an infinitesimally small perturbation up or down that is Gaussian distributed and uh, with mean zero and with a variance that is proportional to the size of the step. There is a lot of deep theory behind this, which again, I don't have time to cover. However, you do know this process from previous lectures and you know that it has a name. It's called the Wiener process and you know that it's a Gaussian process. In fact, as we now see, it's not just a Gaussian process. It's also a Markov process because it has the Markov property and therefore it's called a Gauss Markov process. And there are actually several such Gauss Markov processes. They are a subset of the space of all Gaussian processes, a true subset. And the path created by this kind of infinitesimal step in with this kind of stochastic fashion clearly is described in terms of the dynamics of some, let's just call it stochastic dynamical system. Now, normal non-stochastic dynamical systems are usually described by differential equations. Actually, if they move through time in this one-dimensional fashion, then these are called ordinary differential equations. And so it might seem natural that there is a corresponding concept for these stochastic dynamical processes, and these are called stochastic differential equations. That's how deep the connection is going to go in this lecture. I would just like to leave you with a big caveat that these stochastic differential equations are in many ways more complicated than ordinary differential equations because they involve the use of this Wiener measure, which is actually much harder to define precisely than what I just did in this intuitive fashion by taking these individual steps and making them arbitrarily small. Such stochastic differential equations are usually written in this notation. And this notation for the purposes of this lecture is really just a symbolic thing that actually is just a string you write down to define a Gaussian process and or a Kalman filter. And in the following way. So what you are going to read off now is essentially a definition, a, a backward definition of this line up here. So I will call this particular object, which is called a linear time invariant stochastic differential equation. And it's called linear and time invariant because it involves linear maps F and L, which do not change through time. So they don't depend on T. And um, this thing is called a stochastic differential equation, linear time invariant together with an initial value. So that's the value of X at time T zero and that value, let that, let that value be X zero. This string is meant to describe the local behavior 
of a Gaussian process, and it turns out that this is actually a unique Gaussian process, which has a mean function, and that mean function is given by this object. And for that, we take the exponential of f times the time distance since um, time t0 and map it onto x0. It turns out actually that this is possible to do not just if f is a scalar and if this are, these are all scalar quantities, but even if x is a vector and f is a matrix because there's a corresponding object called the matrix exponential. Down here is the definition of what the matrix exponential is. It's kind of a natural definition, but I'm just going to use it and you can, for uh, like purposes of just understanding what's going on, think of a scalar exponential. But everything works if f is a matrix. So this is the mean of our Gaussian process and it also has a covariance function which, as you know, is the kernel and that kernel is given by this object. So this is an integral from t0 to the minimum of a and b over an essentially an outer product, in the scalar case that's just a square, of um, the exponential of an expression just like before but here we have the integration variable tau in here and this other quantity l in here. So f and l are often associated with physical processes or physical interpretations. This here is the behavior of a deterministic system. And in fact, if you forgot about this term here, if you just dropped it, then this would just be an ordinary differential equation. And this is called the diffusion of this process. Sorry, ah, I'm sorry. This is called the drift of this, of this uh, dynamical system. The uh, drift, as you can see, follows a deterministic ordinary differential equation. So you could solve this ordinary differential equation using an ordinary differential equation solver, or actually, because it's a linear ordinary differential equation, also in closed form, and its behavior would be given exactly by the mean function. And then there is this additional thing, which is the stochastic, which introduces the stochastic nature of this process. And this is called the diffusion of the stochastic process. And it shows up, therefore, necessarily in the bit that defines the stochastic part of the Gaussian process, the kernel, as in this expression where L shows up. Now, this is a way to connect the behavior of this picture to the language that you already know from previous lectures called a Gaussian process. So here we have a mean and a, a mean function and a kernel function. And you know how to do inference in this process using means and covariance functions. But the same expression also connects to a Kalman filter at discrete times um, ti and uh, moving forward. This Gaussian process is often called the solution of this stochastic differential equation and the discrete times stochastic recurrence relation, so that's defined by this Markov type um, predictive distribution, that arises from this kernel can actually be computed with similar quantities. And they turn out to be given by this expression for the quantity A, the linear map, and this expression for the quantity Q. So on this slide, you have now a connection between Gaussian processes and filters. Now, of course, this doesn't answer all of your questions. Um, a natural question might be, but if you give me a filter, how does it map to a Gaussian process? And I can't simply answer this in this one lecture because it would go way beyond the time we have today. If you want to, you can ask me in the flipped classroom and we can talk about it there. Instead of doing this complicated bit, let's do a simple thing and provide two intuitions at the end of this lecture. The first one is just a, just a sanity check to see that what we're doing here actually is exactly what we expect to be doing. So see, let's see whether we can derive the Wiener process in this particular way. It, um, so here I've just written down, like copied over the definitions from the previous slide. It turns out that the Wiener process corresponds to the case where, and that's the reason why this is called the Wiener measure, f is zero and l is a constant. If f is zero and l is a constant, then clearly the mean function is just a constant x0 because e to the zero is one. So m of t is just x0. And a is the unit matrix because e to the zero is one. And actually the matrix exponential of the zero matrix is also the unit matrix. And the 
kernel is, well, let's look at the expression for the kernel up there. This is just um, an integral over a constant function. So e to the zero is one, and we can just get L squared, which is theta squared. And we're left with an integral over theta squared from t zero to the minimum over a and b. And that's clearly just theta squared times the minimum over a and b minus t zero. So that's our Wiener process kernel. So, okay, so that's maybe a sanity check. It works. Now, that isn't particularly interesting. Let's look at another actually almost equally simple stochastic process that we haven't encountered so far yet in um, our lectures about Gaussian processes, but we might as well encounter it now. This process has a physical interpretation. It it's, uh, describes the behavior of a particle in a, a gas, if you like, but that gas is not free. If the particle is, in a, it, it is free, move, free to move around, then its behavior is described by Brownian motion, so by the Wiener process. But if it's not free, but instead it is um, caught by a potential well, and that potential well has a, a linear shape, so it's like a basically like a like a hook, uh, sorry, like a like a spring pulling you back towards zero, then the uh, stochastic differential equation is a linear one where dx dt is just minus a constant times x. So that if you're moving into the positive direction, there is a force acting towards zero. And if you're moving in a negative direction, there is a force acting towards uh, zero again. Then um, the, so F is, a, is minus a constant and L is again, just another constant, which is usually defined in terms of some other quantities that makes things easy. Uh, so two theta divided by the square root of lambda, but those are just some numbers, right? You just think of this as a number. Then clearly, e to a constant will show up in our, in our mean function. The mean function is given by um, x0 times an exponential decay at time t. So if we start at a, a point that isn't zero, so if we start at x0 that isn't zero, then over time this process will decay back to zero. Um, a is given by the simple exponential function and q by this um, constant times a one minus exponential decay. So this means that if you're going a large step forward into the, into the future, then Q asymptotically becomes one. It just adds an, a sort of a finite amount of uncertainty. And if you take a very short step, then Q is again, almost zero. And the corresponding kernel is an interesting thing. It's not the Gaussian kernel. So Make sure you don't mistake this for a Gaussian kernel. It's not e to the minus something square. Instead, it's e to minus time differences between the two points, but just the absolute value of it. This process is a very rough process. It's actually as rough as the Wiener process, but it is stationary, clearly, because this kernel depends only on the distance between a and b, unless um, uh, at least at a point where we're far away from t0, right? So if you're, if you're far away from t0, then, so that means once the, once the process has reached its equilibrium, where uh, in a, a, we have a kernel that is just e to the absolute distance between the points. You can think of this as a physical system that goes into some kind of equilibrium where if you're going far into the future, you don't really know where, the, like where exactly this particle is, but you know that its position is basically bounded by the potential well that keeps it inside. Um, the potential well then being quadratic and the corresponding force being linear. This is maybe one interesting stochastic process to end on. But I'll show you just one more generalization just to make sure you don't mistake this to only work on scalar values. Let me just point out that this process also works, or this kind of way of constructing stochastic processes also works if the operators f and l are not scalar but linear operators, so matrices. Um, this kind of notion can be, can be used to define very interesting stochastic processes. In particular, you can use the fact that we're essentially solving a differential equation here to define objects that are, that's to define stochastic processes that are the integral over processes like, for example, the Wiener process or the einstein ulmbeck process. This is what is on this slide here. If you do a single integral, if you do this, as multiple integration, so you introduce more and more of these latent states and, be, and define f such that it is of this sort of uh, integrator type, then the, uh, the resulting 
stochastic process is either the integral or Brownian motion. So we've already seen this, what this gives. It gives us polynomial splines. Or it is if we use the einstein uhlenbeck process as the starting point. So if there's this corrective term on the lower right corner of F, it gives rise to a family of stochastic processes that are known as the matern type processes or the uh, the corresponding kernels are called the Matern family of kernels. These are actually quite popular in machine learning in regression because they are less extreme and aggressive than the Gaussian kernel because they only assume that the corresponding stochastic process or the sample paths have finitely many uh, continuous derivatives. If you didn't understand this, it doesn't matter. I just wanted to point out that there is uh, a way to do this beyond just scalar objects. With that, we're at the end. We, saw, we considered today, just for today, a specific kind of stochastic process which is defined or which is specifically useful for data types that are structured as time series. That means they have a one-dimensional ordered input and um, typically arrive in a sequence that might even be infinitely long. That means on the one hand, that the kind of prediction we want to make is a local one. We want to keep track of what we know given the past and then predict this, the future. And it, it doesn't matter so much what we predicted in the past. We only want to predict locally. That means we want to predict marginals. And on the, on the other hand, we need a way to do this at low computational cost because, because we want to keep doing it. And that means that the overall cost of inference has to be linear in the number of data points. Markov chain structured models provide these kind of inference models and um, they automatically give rise to inference algorithms which take the structure of a filter going forward through time and a smoother going backward through time. That's an abstract structure for the inference algorithm which we'll actually return to at data points in the lecture because it'll turn out to be a specific case of an algorithm that even works for somewhat more complicated structured graphs. If we assume that all the variables in this kind of model are jointly Gaussian distributed and linearly related, then the corresponding algorithm has a concrete form that can be implemented very efficiently on a computer and it's called the Kalman filter for the forward pass and the RTS, Rauchtungstriebel, smoother for the backward pass. These models are defined in a quite different way to Gaussian processes, but they are actually Gaussian processes. They are Gauss-Markov processes. They are a subtype of all Gaussian processes. And they are connected to Gaussian processes through the notion of a stochastic differential equation, which is an abstract concept that comes with a lot of mathematical caveats, but once you write it down, it essentially defines both a Gaussian process with a kernel and a mean function and a linear recurrence Gaussian recurrence relationship that is defined in terms of these operators A and Q. This short lecture today was really just a very first and short look into Markov type models, time series models. We only had time to look at the abstract case to discover the notion of filtering and smoothing. We, and then we looked at what is maybe a very restrictive form of definition, these linear Gaussian, Gauss-Markov models. As you can maybe guess from the last few slides, there is a much more complicated world of theory about these models. In particular, there are inference algorithms for these kind of settings if the relationship between the true function, the true states and the observed variables is not linear and not Gaussian. These are called filters, more generally than Kalman filters. And there are also models for the case where the relationship between the latent states is not linear and Gaussian. These are called hidden Markov models. In this basic introductory lecture on probabilistic machine learning, there is unfortunately not time to cover all of these. For here, for today, for us, we're finished. Thank you very much for your time and I'm hoping I'll see you again at the next lecture.